His main academic journey started as a student in the uh, integrated PhD program of IAC and TIFR, uh, from which he obtained a master's degree and then also a PhD in 2005. And since then his journey, academic journey has been very fruitful. And now uh, he has become director of this computational science at ETH. His interests are also numerous and scientific computing being a common thread among them. So numerical analysis, scientific computing, nonlinear PDE, uh, machine learning now, CFD and many more. Okay, his research has been recognized with many awards and honors. And some of them are uh, GAMM Fawn Mises Prize in 2015, then Jack Louis Leons, we call Senior Leons Medal in 2018, ICIAM Collars Prize in 2019, and Infosys Prize in, again in 2019. He was an invited speaker at the International Congress of Mathematics at Rio in 2018. Today, he will speak on physics-informed machine learning. Over to you, Siddha. First of all, thank you, Professor Dutti, for the very generous and kind introduction. And I also take this opportunity to again thank uh, Praveen and Venki for putting together this conference in honor of Professor Vasudev Murthy. I chose a topic that uh, is not just in my contemporary research, but also it has a strong imprint of Professor Vasudev Murthy and his influence, his scientific influence on me, which runs deep. And you'll see where, where that will come in. I will, I'll, I'll make an effort to sort of talk about that. So let's talk about physics-inspired machine learning. So these days, machine learning, particularly deep learning, this is extremely successful. We see evidence of it in our daily lives all the time whether it comes to translation or facial recognition or self-driving cars, scene identification here, or even scientific problems like protein folding. So this is extremely successful. It's the most powerful technology of these days. Uh, in our setup, uh, machine learning is also being increasingly used in simulating physical systems, which are modeled by PDEs, of course. And in my lab, and you have already seen examples of that in the talk by Deep Ray uh, yesterday. And you'll see further examples, I think, in the talk by Professor Amit Apte after my talk. So you can use deep neural networks, which are sort of the main backbone of deep learning, to solve or to solve what is called supervised learning problem for parameterized PDEs. And you can use this downstream. You can use it for uncertainty quantification, for control, for Bayesian inversion. You can even do uh, learn the whole operator, the solution operator, which is a mapping between infinite dimensional function spaces with some of these objects. And I have spoken about this at the TIFR Center, for instance, last year. You can also solve uh, PDEs and ODs for that matter directly by using what are called physics-informed neural networks. And one of the problems that you can solve in this respect is the radiative transfer equations, which was something, a topic that was very close to Professor Vasudev Murthy's heart. So this is a high dimensional problem. You have six dimensions. So it could also be seven dimensions if you're looking at let's say in the astrophysical con context, and this can be solved using these physics informed neural networks. So in short, uh, machine learning, particularly deep learning, is having a huge impact on simulations of ordinary and partial differential equations, very big impact, and it will have an increasingly bigger impact in the years to come. But the question that I'm asking is the reverse one, the converse one. So the question is the following, can physical systems, concepts, principles, can these help in designing better machine learning uh, algorithms. So the other way around, so machine learning impacts physics, but the question is, can our understanding of physics and physical systems impact machine learning? And this is becoming an increasingly, let's say, trendy topic. Many, many big progress, uh, progresses have been made in recent years. In this talk, I'll just focus on what we do in my lab and I'll highlight uh, if time permits too, but certainly one of them. So I'll talk about sequential modeling and learning on graphs, if time permits. So let me start with sequential modeling. So it turns out that sequences are uh, ubiquitous in science, in engineering, and in our daily lives. 
think just of uh, weather measurements, right? Now it's very hot in India, but if you just uh, measure or uh, look at re temperature recordings as a function of time, you get a time series. And the question is, given the last 10 days of uh, temperature time or uh, temperature recordings or temperature measurements, can you predict the temperature tomorrow or day after tomorrow and so on? So any dynamical system uh, ends up uh, you know, to a problem in time series. So, so this, is, this is obvious. The second uh, big source is, of course, languages, speech. When I talk or when Professor Dutti spoke, well, it, was, it was a time series, not just in Fourier space, but also just uh, it was a time series. And the question is, by listening to me, can you find out what language I am talking? Can you predict what's the next word that I'm going to say? This is essential in machine intelligence. So this is, uh, these are examples where time series comes up. So in mathematical terms, we are looking at sequences. Um, it could be infinite sequences, but let's talk about finite sequences. And the idea is that there are mappings which take an input sequence and produce an output sequence. Input sequence, for instance, could be temperature recordings for the next 10 days, for the last 10 days. Output sequence could be the temperature recording for the next 10 days, or it could be speech now. And the output could also be a single scalar or a vector. So essentially, the idea is that we learn maps between sequences, or we want to approximate maps between sequences. How is this? And we want to do it from data. So by the temperature recordings in Bangalore for the last 30 years, we are going to make predictions uh, for the future. So this is roughly the idea behind time series or sequential learning. Now, how, do, how is it done in machine learning? The most popular approach, at least till very recently, it has been overtaken by what are called transformers these days, is by using what are called recurrent neural networks. Now, recurrent neural networks, let's just focus on the math. They are a very simple object. So the idea is that, see, remember, the mapping that we want to learn is from some input state, xn, to some output state, yn. And what this uh, algorithm or what this uh, construction does is that it passes this data through what is called a hidden state. So here is the idea. Here is the sort of formulas for this. So given an input xn and given a hidden state X, F, hn minus 1 and given some learnable or trainable parameters theta, I have a mapping here, f, a nonlinear mapping, of course, and I produce the next hidden state. And given this hidden state, I use the matrix or it could be something affine, but let's say some a linear map to produce the output state. So I'm going to approximate my input to output mapping about which I have no intrinsic information except for the data, except for the measurements. And I'm going to approximate it by objects of this particular mathematical form. And these are what are called recurrent neural networks. So you can think of them as discrete, as a discrete dynamical system. And uh, we have to, so these are trainable parameters. So these are things that have to be learned from the data. And we have to supply the form of this map F, for instance. Okay, so this is this is roughly the idea behind sequential modeling, or by using recurrent neural networks. Now, this has been very very successful. However, there is a formidable challenge that comes in almost immediately. The way you learn this, or the way you approximate these maps, is by learning these parameters. And how do you learn these parameters? This theta and this W zero, this matrix here. You learn these parameters by using what is called training, by taking all the data that you have and trying to fit the data, fit these parameters to data so that you get the best fit or the best match to the data. Now, if you do that, so you have, you have a loss function, right? You have, a, you have a mismatch. So this is the mismatch. So this will be the output of the neural network. And this is your ground truth, which you know, observe data. And you want to minimize this as a function of time. Right? So when you minimize this, you want to compute what are the parameters that correspond to the best fit. And this requires us to use some sort of a, this optimization problem. And how do you solve an optimization problem? You use a gradient descent algorithm. And to compute, uh, or in order to enact a gradient descent algorithm, I need to compute gradients. So when I take a parameter theta and I compute the gradient with respect to this loss function, I get this essentially chain rule and product rule. I get an expression like this. Okay, fair enough, nothing, nothing big here, but let's concentrate on this blue term. And when we concentrate on this blue term, because we have this uh, time dependent mapping, it goes one to the other, to the other, to the other, and so on, you get a product, of course. This is just product rule. And the product rule says that you have an expression like this. So I, I'll tell you the physical meaning of this expression. But the moment you have a product, remember that this could be a long product, right? Because if your sequence has a thousand members, in principle, you could have a long product. So if on an average, each term is like 1.1, 1.1 to the power 1,000 is a huge number. 
So your gradient is going to blow up exponentially. Similarly, if on an average, this thing is like 0 0.9, 0 0.9 to the power 1000 is a very, very small number and your gradient is going to decay exponentially. So this exponential growth or decay of the gradient is what is called as the exploding and vanishing gradient problem. And whenever you're trying to train these neural networks to fit data, you have to confront this challenge because yes, we have these long products. So physically speaking, what this long product implies is this, this term here tells you the influence that my input or hidden state at let's say state two has on the output at state thousand. So in other words, uh, the temperature today is the, how does it depend on the temperature last year? So this is what it, it measures long-term dependencies. And it's always difficult to learn long-term dependencies. Just like as humans, it is difficult for us to retrieve long-term memories. It is exactly in the same pattern. So that's why it's a formidable challenge to be able to train these neural networks. But there have been, of course, this has been 30 years of work. People have found out ways. So the most common ways, I'm not going to spend too much of time on them, is by using what are called gating mechanisms. This leads to different architectures, long short-term memory, gated recurrent unit, and so on. And the idea is that instead of having a pure product, you have some sums, you know, some the gates are essentially some sort of sums. They tell you that, okay, the influence is going to be less if it is uh, of a long term. So because of this additive structure, you don't have uh, the gradient uh, vanishing, but you can still have it exploding. And if you have very long term dependencies, it anyway doesn't work. So it, it works if you only have a sequence of length 100, but if you have a sequence of length 1000, it stops working. So this is one of the problems. Uh, other people, for instance, Joshua Bengio, who won the Turing Prize uh, a couple of years back, his focus has been, for instance, saying that, okay, uh, if it is uh, far away from one, the norm here of these uh, matrices, then of course, uh, things blow up or they vanish. So why don't we try to keep it as close to one as possible? And one way to do that is to have structural constraints, for in instance, introduce some unitary assumptions of some orthogonality. And this allows you to keep uh, training for long long periods because your norm is close to one. However, when you constrain the structure, of course, you have some limited expressivity. You learn less because the, if you want to learn, you need to learn much more. You need to have the freedom to learn as much as possible. So there are issues with these things. So when we started looking at this problem last year, roughly speaking, or maybe a little before that, uh, my thinking was, why don't we look at what the brain does? After all, our brain is very, very versatile in learning long-term dependencies, right? We still remember things as Professor Dutti said today from 40 years ago. So we, we somehow our brain is able to do that. So of course, no one knows the details of how the brain does that, but let's look at the abstract picture, right? So one thing is that uh, brain consists of neurons and these neurons, if you look at the signals inside the neurons, these are nothing but oscillators because what you get out of neurons are oscillations. But these are circuits of neurons, uh, so functional brain circuits. These are networks of neurons. So uh, the neurons which are talking to each other all the time. So somehow the key point here is oscillations or oscillatory networks, right? This is sort of the, the, the key abstraction here. And we know that in physics, oscillators are ubiquitous. I Means the first physical system that we learn rigorously mathematically are nothing but pendulums, right? And the point about oscillations is that these are very stable. Not only the, if you think of sine or cosine functions, not only are the functions themselves very stable, the gradients are very stable. So there is some chance that the gradients are going to be, because what we need is to look for bounded gradients. So these systems have bounded gradients somehow by construction. Uh, moreover, if you remember that uh, any function, L2 function, square integrable function, you can express it by essentially Fourier expansions. Uh, and Fourier expansions are nothing but representing things in terms of oscillations. So in principle, any arbitrary function can be learned in terms of oscillations. So this is somehow the rough uh, idea. So the idea was, why don't we try to sort of design this recurrent neural networks based on coupled oscillators? And indeed we did that. Uh, I will give you several examples of that. So the first paper was in last year's iClear big machine learning conference. Uh, and the idea is the following. So we want to design coupled oscillators, right? As your RNN. And this is mathematically, let's just boil down to the math here. So I have vectors, of course, these are big vectors as you will see, but essentially this is a second order coupled ODE system, which models coupled oscillators. So y is your displacement variable, roughly speaking. So it's a second derivative. So this is essentially Newton's law. The fact that I have a gamma here tells me what is the natural frequency of the oscillation. I need some damping because otherwise things might blow up. And here is the nonlinearity. 
The nonlinearity includes coupling because things are coupled here with these matrices, uh, both these matrices. It includes the modulation by the input. It includes driving and things like that. And finally, it includes some nonlinear modulation. So this, what is called activation function is a time hyperbolic tangent. So that things remain between minus one and one. And so this ODE represents a system of coupled damped forced oscillators. So this is sort of the mathematical construction here. And of course, once you have this, you can write it, you know, to solve it uh, numerically, we need, we need an algorithm at the end of the day, we write it as a first order system. And uh, to do something structure preserving, we use implicit explicit discretization, something I learned first from Vasu long, long back, but this is uh, what we do. So we, um, the first step here is going to be uh, the nonlinearities are done explicitly, the linear terms are done implicitly, and you get something which is structure preserving. So the good thing about this system is because of the stability of oscillatory dynamics, we can prove quite a few nice properties. Of course, we need some assumptions which are readily verified on the weights and biases. But under these assumptions, the details are not important. First, we can prove that the gradient can never explode. It can rise linearly in terms of the number of elements of the sequence, uh, polynomially at least, but it can never explode. So that's exponentially. So that's the first good thing. So we are bound on the gradient. Second, we were able to uh, write down an asymptotic formula, essentially, even though we couldn't explicitly solve the system, we can write down an asymptotic formula. And we see that the gradient itself, it can become small as a function of your time step, but it can never, dec uh, it can never go down exponentially. It's also polynomially decaying. So there is no vanishing gradient problem. So rigorously, we have proved by this construction that we got rid of this exploding and vanishing gradient, which is good mathematically. However, the proof of the pudding lies in the eating. We have to check whether this can learn any meaningful things or not. So let me give you first some toy problems where uh, you see the power of this method. So the first example is a very simple time series uh, problem. So I have a two dimensional input sequence. It could be very long, but it's two dimensional. In the first dimension, I take random numbers between zero and one, just random numbers. In the second dimension, what I do is I have essentially one, two ones, and the rest are zeros, okay? And uh, halfway through the sequence, uh, within halfway, I have a one in a random location. And in the next half of the sequence, I have another one in a random location. Now, for each uh, draw, I have different locations of these ones. And the output is going to be simply the sum of the first elements here corresponding to these ones. So essentially, it's a very, it's called the adding problem. It was invented uh, to learn this long-term dependencies because it has to remember, remember that uh, to the learning system, you're giving things one by one as a sequence. So it has to remember how far back uh, things were and operate on them, right? So this is the basic setup. Uh, just by doing nothing, just by drawing things at random, you would get an error of uh, 0 0.167. So you have to do better than that. And this is for different um, sequence lengths. Let's just focus on the length of 5,000. And you can see that only our algorithm is able to beat not just the baseline, it goes to zero very, very quickly, the error. So it does a very good job here. And none of the other algorithms are able to handle this. In fact, later on, we I don't have the examples here, but we could do like sequences of length 20,000 more or less. So very, very long sequences, and it gives you the right answer. So this, this does work in that sense. Here is another sort of uh, problem of image recognition. So many of you might have seen this handwritten digits. These are called MNIST digits. And you have to, the machine learning system has to identify what the digit is. So for us, it's very easy to see it's three, but for a machine, it's not so easy. And to make our life difficult, you are not showing the whole image, but you are showing it uh, pixel by pixels as a sequence. So you take a sequence or you take this image, which has 784 pixels, and you put them into a sort of a long vector or sequence of length 784, give it to the learning system one by one and ask it to classify the digit. And to make its life harder, what you do is also to put some random permutations in it. So this is a very, very common uh, benchmark problem in this direction. And our system is the state of the art, or at least it was the state of the art one, you know, in machine learning, things change very, very quickly. But one year ago, we were really state of the art on this problem. You can see that we were at 99.3, 99.4% of accuracy. So it was able to recognize these digits very, very well, even though they were given as a sequence. So this again was able to show. Now, remember that uh, when I designed this machine learning system, it had nothing to do with images, right? It was designed as oscillators, but these oscillators have the expressivity to be able to read images. 
Uh, the final example in this context, it's uh, sentiment analysis. So these are movie reviews. So you look at movie reviews, read the movie reviews. It's a sequence. And then you say whether it's a positive review or a negative review. That's what the computer is going to say, not us. And again, the, this is not a long memory problem, but nevertheless, uh, it's uh, something which tells you about the expressivity, the learning ability of the system. And it still was able to do a good job. Uh, it's actually in the, in the class that we looked at, it was the best in the class. So this was, this was good news. But not everything is honky-dory to use an expression that Vasu always used. Uh, not everything is honky-dory here. There are some issues with it. Uh, one thing is that it's relatively slow. You know, these things have to be ultra fast. It also requires a lot of memory. It is a large, because all these hidden states that we have in the system, they have to be stored during training. So now we, uh, in the last year's ICML, another big machine learning conference, we proposed a variant of it, uh, Unicorn, which is, uh, the basis of this is, uh, instead of using some damped uh, system of oscillators, we said, okay, why don't we use a Hamiltonian system? And why Hamiltonian system? Because Hamiltonian systems, they have Liouville's theorem. So the state space volume is always going to be conserved. So essentially you have some stability built in, more or less, uh, these things are invertible. You know, Hamiltonian systems have invertible dynamics. So that's a, that's a good thing. So we came up with a time-dependent Hamiltonian system, which is essentially oscillators, but without the damping. And there were several sort of engineering aspects to it. We used a symplectic Euler uh, time integrator. We used something which is multi-scale and so on. Uh, but the main point is, again, we were because of the Hamiltonian dynamics, we were able to prove rigorously that there is no exploding gradient, there is no vanishing gradient. Because it's invertible in time, it was memory efficient because we just had to store the last state and we could reproduce everything back in time. And it was also, we could do a very, very fast implementation on uh, graphics processing units. How fast? So this is the state of the art. Uh, this is done by NVIDIA, who are the world leaders in this. And for a single run of the LSTM, they could do it in about, let's say 40, 35 seconds. Our implementation on the other hand was half the time of that. You know, one PhD student who could do it. So this was, this was really impressive in that time. And compared to what we had, this was 50 times faster and equally good. So for instance, on the same problem of this identifying digits or sequences, uh, earlier we had something like 97.3 in this particular class. And now we could get, for instance, 98.4%. So this is, uh, increases the accuracy. Let me move to some more interesting problems. So this is a very fun problem because uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a problem. The data set comes from Harvard biology department. So this is a worm, uh, C. elegans, a uh, very common worm that is used for research in neurobiology. And what they do is that they make the worm move along an agar plate. Uh, they, they move the worm, they record its motion. Uh, so this will be a time series. And just based on the movement, they're able to classify whether it is a wild type or there are four different mutants, you know? So somehow the genetic information can be de derived just by looking at how it moves around, which is, uh, I don't understand why this happens. But anyway, this is a time series. The result is that you have to classify into five types, just looking at the time series. And the point is that it has very, very long input sequences, 18,000. And these are not, uh, so there are long-term dependencies here that one has to somehow recover. So before uh, we looked into the problem, the state of the art was really below 70%. In fact, some of the best designed uh, algorithms are like 40 and 50%. So then we ran our algorithms on it and you can see that we were able to get very, very high accuracy. So 86%, 90% and so on, which is, uh, so it looks at the time series and says, okay, it's a mutant or it's a wild type or which kind of mutant it is. So this, uh, this was able to solve this, uh, it's a very long time classification problem. Here's another example much more relevant, particularly with COVID, because all of us, at least, I don't know whether people did it in India, but in Europe and the US, people started buying these pulse oximeters. These are things that you put into your uh, finger and you compute your heart rate, your blood oxygen levels and things like that. So what do, how do they operate? So what these kind of sensors do is that they measure things like PPG signals and ECG signals. And out of that, they have to infer, they have to predict or regress uh, to use statistics, things like the respiration rate and the heart rate and uh, blood oxygen levels and so on. And the state of the art is what is called LSTM. These are defective things. You know, they, they, they produce errors of like 10% uh, because these are also long sequences. These are like uh, 4,000 uh, sequence length. And again, uh, because we have this very fast implementation, we could uh, run these uh, very, very quickly. And you can see that uh, again, we, we improve for instance, compared to LSTM, we have a 10 times improvement here. 
So problems like this, which require, you know, from different areas of science, we could uh, solve with this particular system. But uh, again, what, uh, what hit uh, me, what was always sort of making me restless was the fact that we're using oscillators, right? At the end of the day, we're using oscillators. Okay, this is, uh, we have oscillations, so it's not surprising. Here also, perhaps you can argue that there are oscillations, so it's not surprising. But what about some of these other problems? I Means there's no evidence of oscillations. Of course, oscillations are universal because you can approximate a heaviside function with, uh, with Fourier series, but it takes a lot of, lot of uh, sequence members, right? So the question always remained, can they approximate any time series efficient? We were never able to prove, by the way, that this can be done. And we saw that, for instance, if you look at language modeling, so what language modeling does is that uh, you read a sentence or you read a paragraph, and the machine learning system is able to predict the next word or the next character and so on and so forth. And that's how you see we get all these uh, newspaper articles written by machine learning systems these days. So on this, on a very sort of a standard data set, it's called Pentry Bank from the University of Pennsylvania. We saw that uh, our performance was still much worse or significantly worse than that of uh, LSTM. These are not long dependencies, these are short dependencies. And what we wanted is uh, to sort of uh, overcome this challenge, right? And this is where, uh, again, if you look at the brain more carefully, and this is where uh, sort of uh, the influence of Vasu, Vasu comes in in a, in, a, in a clear manner, is if you look at the signal from the brain very carefully, this is an idealized signal, uh, all the noise has been taken out, but you see that there are two scales here. And the first scale, of course, is there is a very fast spike but there is a relatively slow relaxation, fast spike, slow relaxation, and so on. So brain actually is a multi-scale, at least a two-scale dynamical system at the level of individual neurons. And multi-scale systems are ubiquitous in physics. And this is certainly something that I first learned from Vasu because you know, he was working on multi-scale problems in the 1980s with the Ramdas layer and so on. And we have discussed this many times. So why not use these ideas uh, into the mix so let's try to see how multi-scale systems can be, can be designed. And this is, uh, again, in this year's, it was a spotlight talk in this year's iClear uh, machine learning conference. It's done with a group in uh, UC Berkeley. And the idea is, uh, the, our final architecture is called long expressive memory. Uh, but the idea is somehow to use multi-scale ODEs, not necessarily oscillations, but multi-scale ODEs, which could be oscillations. So this is the simplest example of a two-scale ODE. I'm writing everything in terms of vectors. But I have two time scales, uh, tau y and tau z here. But in practice, uh, no one knows what the time scales are going to be. So you have to learn the time scales. So what we did is that instead of setting the time scales a priori, we want it to be learned from the data. So this is the same system, but now the time scales are also going to be learned. They, they, they are given through this modulation, nonlinear modulation functions. And of course, there is some dynamics uh, with some dissipation that is that is very natural. So this is, a, uh, let's say, not a universal ODE, but a very clear example of a multi-scale ODE system. Then, of course, we discretize this uh, with the IMAX, uh, implicit explicit time discretization. And this is what we call as long expressive memory. The po point about this is it has, OK, let's see. So first of all, uh, we can prove a lot of nice theoretical guarantees on the system. So first of all, the way the system has been structured, all the hidden states are going to be bounded by minus one and one. So they're always in between that. Uh, because of uh, the way in which we have structured our system, we were able to prove bounds on the gradients. So upper bounds on the gradients, uh, the gradient can't explode exponentially. Also asymptotic formulas like we did before. So the gradient can't vanish exponentially either. So that problem is solved. But the next results, the theorems are what are important here because this tells you some universality. So for instance, you take any dynamical system which can be written in this form. So you have a hidden state. This is a, it's a, just a continuous map, a continuous vector field. And then this is also another continuous vector field. So very, very general class of dynamical systems. This we can approximate with what we have here. You know, we don't have a very general, we have a very specific one. This is a hyperbolic tangent and this is a logistic function. So these are very specific functions. Yet, because of the universal approximation due to neural networks, we can prove that this can be approximated. Not only that, you can also approximate multi-scale dynamical systems where the parameters don't depend on the small scale. And this is the important fact. If they depend on the small scale, you can approximate anything. The reason why I could do it is, again, some numerical analysis here, because these guys here were based on um, what is called the heterogeneous multi-scale method. 
for uh, for ODEs, in fact, essentially. So this is also something I learned from Vasu many, many, many years ago. So all these things that I learned from him, they are useful somewhere, you know, so these tricks are, are very, very useful. Now, this system works very well, for instance, on the same uh, classification problem. With our earlier systems, we are able to get 90% accuracy. Now we get even better, 92, 93%. In fact, in some shots, we even had 99% accuracy. So statistically, of course, the mean is like 92.3%. Uh, also, similarly, here on the heart rate prediction, uh, we, we, we improved the state of the art considerably. Even our own previous systems are beaten. So now this is really less than 1% accuracy. So you can really use this for these, uh, these kind of uh, devices. Let's, let's put it that way. Uh, what about language modeling, right? This is what uh, we wanted. And remember that LSTM was state of the art, at least in this class of systems, it was 1.36, lower the better. It's called bit per character, so lower the better. And now with our system, we were able to improve it here by more than 10%. But at the word level, that is given a sequence of words, you predict the next word and keep on predicting the next word, we were significantly better. So we reduced what is called the perplexity by a factor of almost 40%. So this is uh, almost universal in that, in that sense. And why does it work so well? Remember, it is based on a multi-scale system. So let's take a very simple multi-scale system, uh, also something that I learned from Vasu long, long back. Uh, this is a fritz Nakumo system, which is uh, right here. So it has two scales. Uh, one scale is one and the other is 0 0.02, one over 50. And now I just take data from the system and I'm going to make the predictions with my LEM, my long expressive memory model. So this, it doesn't have any information about the given scales. It has to identify them from data. And this is how it does. So if I look at its learnable time steps, you see clearly that there is a bimodal distribution here with one mode near 0 0.02, close to 0 0.02, and another mode very close to one. So it really is able to learn things from data. And because of that, you can see that LSTM had an error of 1.12% in this case, and this goes down to 2% or 0.2%. So it is uh, really it reduces by almost an order of magnitude because it is able to learn this multiple scales on the fly from the data itself. Now, here is an interesting example means, okay, in a ODE system, we know that there are two scales, we supplied the scales and the machine learning system is able to learn it. But for instance, speech recognition. So Google has this uh, speech recognition database where what you do is that uh, the machine learning system listens to the frequencies and then it's able to say what are the keywords you know there are 30 or 12 keywords and okay we do very well on this system as you can see we are able to improve things from lstm uh, lstm was also doing a good job but surprisingly who knows what are the scales in speech or in language and yet to we see a multi-scale behavior but now instead of having this bimodal distribution you have a continuous uh, sort of spectrum in scales. And not only that, it sort of decays as a power law. So something is happening here that makes these sort of multi-scale systems work. And you see that because if I did not allow for multi-scale behavior, then I was getting 65% accuracy. As I allowed more and more scales to be learned dynamically, you see that there is a monotone improvement till it saturates. At some point, it, uh, it saturates. You can't do, uh, can't do better. So the multiple scale behavior is absolutely essential here. And that's why LEM uh, is sort of a competitive architecture for sequence modeling. Now, let me, I have seven minutes. So I'll try to very quickly run through another class of problems where, uh, this, uh, where this kind of a philosophy of using physics helps. And this is learning on graphs, whenever data has a structure of a graph. Now, problems on graphs are ubiquitous, right? Social networks. So this is a sort of idealized version of Facebook. So recommendations on social networks, each time you look at YouTube, uh, whatever comes as a recommender systems. Now, of course, chemistry, biology, molecules are graphs, right? So this is uh, ubiquitous. Uh, transportation systems are graphs, airline systems, train systems, bus systems. And for us in scientific computing, mesh-based simulations means meshes are the simplest example of graphs. So in many, many problems, the underlying data structure is that of a graph. So, and we want to learn on a graph. Right. For instance, we want to learn, for instance, if you have the molecular graph, you want to learn some molecular property, uh, uh, for instance. Right. So at the moment, the way it is done is by using what are called graph neural networks. So the idea behind a graph neural network is the input is given as a graph. The output could be a vector or input is given on a graph rather than, uh, rather than as a graph. And the output could be a vector or a scalar or uh, whatever, or even a function uh, if you're looking in an operator sense. 
And the main point is what is called message passing. So roughly speaking, what you do is in a graph, you have connectivities, you have structures, neighborly, uh, neighborhood structures, and all that it, uh, you do is that at this node, whatever quantity you want to update, you take information from the neighbors and you do an update. So this roughly speaking is message passing. And there are many, many different architectures uh, using convolutions. So this is essentially graph Laplacians, attention and so on. But the point with it is that surprisingly, uh, not surprisingly, you'll see why it is the case, is that graph neural networks are rather shallow in, a, in the sense that you can only use one or two hidden layers. And because if you use a lot of layers, then you get what is called oversmoothing. Now, oversmoothing, the idea behind oversmoothing is very simple because message passing is nothing but a diffusion on a graph. And as you let diffusion run through, then what happens is that the heat equation, you know, so ultimately things are evened out. So if you look at the H1 norm or what is called the Dirichlet energy for a graph, this guy is going to decay exponentially because it's a diffusion, so it decays exponentially. In fact, people had not even uh, written this expression before because they, they don't know these properties of diffusion. So we defined oversmoothing as something that uh, there is a decay, n is the number of time steps, you, uh, or number of diffusion steps that you are going to do. So this leads to oversmoothing, and because of this, there is no, you can't use the graph neural network anymore because it gives you the same value everywhere. So what is the idea? How do we sort of um, mitigate the situation, right? So again, the solution is to look at the brain. So if you look at the brain, the brain itself is a very rich graph neural network with lots and lots of uh, neurons. And each neuron has oscillations. Remember that this was sort of the sort of the mantra here. So it's sort of very, very important here. So networks on oscillators are also ubiquitous in physics. You can think of networks on pendulums. So our architecture, which was designed with people at the University of Oxford and also at Twitter, Twitter AI, is to use uh, essentially networks oscillators, but these oscillators are connected with graphs. So this is called GraphCon. Uh, it is under review in the ICML conference this year. Uh, let's see what happens to that. But the idea is that again, you instead of uh, doing this message passing, instead of just updating information from neighbors, you solve a, a ODE, a second order ODE here. And this is a second order ODE that you are going. This is your natural frequency. This is your decay. And it turns out that uh, in, the, in the continuous limit, in the limit as uh, the number of nodes goes to infinity, you recover what is called a telegrapher's equation, some version of a telegrapher's equation. And who was the first person who told me what a telegrapher's equation was? So Professor Vasudev Murthy, of course. So this again, somehow his role comes in again and again, as of many of my other teachers, but it's his uh, his day to day. So we talk about that. So now, of course, you, you do some discretization. One has to discretize uh, this, let's say, wave, damped wave equation, and we do that. And the point is that this is a general framework you can use in the, as a coupling function, as this nonlinearity. You can use anything that you want. You can use graph convolutions. You can use graph attentions. But these are sort of um, details, let's put it that way. The whole point is that by stacking things in terms of these oscillators, we can recover existing architectures as fixed points. And we can prove, for instance, uh, that uh, so uh, the, the point is it's related to exponential stability uh, or exponential instabilities in this particular case. And we are able to prove that these states, these constant states are not going to be exponentially stable. Essentially with wave equations, even with damped wave equations, you can't really reach uh, constant equilibria that easily. That's the, that's the basic idea. And it works very well. So these are, uh, I'll very quickly go through my examples. So here's an example of uh, classical sort of citation graphs. Cora is, uh, and Sightseer and PubMed, these are very classical graphs. And you see that uh, in all these graphs, uh, our performance here is um, state of the art, more or less. And some of these heterophilic graphs uh, sets also, we are state of the art, for instance, this Wisconsin data set. We have something like 87.8%. But the architecture that we base on uh, graph convolutions, which is nothing but a graph Laplacian was only 51%. So just by adding this oscillatory dynamics, we have been able to improve uh, almost by 30, 35%, right? And the same with attention. So this, this really is able to, as a framework, give you considerable amount of improvement over existing architectures. Just the last examples and I will stop. So these are what are called graph level tasks on uh, yeah, transductive node level tasks. So protein-protein interactions. So these are 
and then the score is given by this micro average f1 i don't have the time to de uh, describe the details but the main point is again that we are more or less state of the art um, over a whole bunch of other people who have worked on this problem similarly on this molecular data set it's called uh, gin and you are interested in computing different molecular properties again we reduce the error by a factor of 2 which is considerable uh, for these kind of data sets so just by using these physical principles we have been able to design an architecture that can learn on graphs uh, without this over smoothing uh, constraint or over smoothing problem so just summarizing as i said i gave you two examples of uh, of course machine learning has a big role to play in physics it does play a big role but the other way around where we use physical principles to design good machine learning systems is getting more and more attention and uh, i showed you examples with uh, sequential learning and with graph learning and it, the main point is that rigorously we are able to prove that some of the fundamental problems like exploding and vanishing gradients or over smoothing these are solved by using this physics inspired or pde inspired ode inspired architectures right and uh, there are many many sort of uh, follow up projects that we are going what, what we are doing at the moment uh, but this is this is for another day so thank you very much for your attention and i stop here because my time is almost over